There is a mysterious object in the universe that illuminates the centres of galaxies, in which a supermassive black hole, a billion times more massive than our sun, feasts on surrounding material. These active galactic nuclei, with ginormous accretion disks and light speed jets, are simply known as quasars. So let's jump into the universe and start discovering these rather quirky quasars. In the 1950s, there was a new way to study the night sky, radio astronomy. Observing cosmic objects with visible light was simply yesterday's news. Surveys of the sky could now be seen in a different light. Radio emissions were discovered everywhere, from the surface of the Sun to the centre of the Milky Way galaxy. In the mid-1960s, a Dutch astronomer using the HAL telescope in California caught his first glimpse at one such radio source. He then thought to measure its redshift, and found something rather spectacular. The object in question was two and a half billion light years away, but it was immensely bright, and this raised an eyebrow, or two. So he then thought to measure its magnitude, and found it to be minus 26.7. By the way, the lower the figure, the brighter the object. This number seemed to have one problem. Well, at least one main problem. The celestial object was four trillion times brighter than the sun. Or maybe even more puzzling, brighter than the entire Milky Way galaxy. This raised another eyebrow, or two, again. Schmidt then pondered a name for his cosmic companion and christened it a quasi-stellar radio source. But because this is astronomy, and astronomy is really cool, they later shortened it to just Quasar. The object was known as 3C273, but that's rather boring and doesn't really roll off the tongue unless you're a robot or you like catalog numbers. So let's call it Quinton the Quasar. That works pretty well. Radio astronomy is a lot older than you think. It started in the 1930s, accidentally of course, by Karl Jansky. World War II helped somewhat by the development of radar technology, giving birth to a survey completed in the early 1950s. The earlier surveys recorded were at a very low frequency of 81.5 megahertz, or 81 million cycles per second. This was done with rather primitive technology and hindered the early pioneers. The low frequency was therefore difficult to locate the signals so their results were few and far between. By the way, Karl Jansky is remembered for the unit of Jansky. This is the flux density measured across the strength of a signal and measured in watts per square meter per hertz, or simply known as a Jansky. We'll be coming back to this a bit later. The Radio Astronomy Group, or the group that simply low catalog numbers, began a survey using radio emissions in 1955. This would pick up signals at 159 megahertz, so a lot stronger this time. The signal strength was a lot better at resolving very faint sources, and this successfully guided astronomers to their first discovery of a quasar, or make that too. The electromagnetic radiation released from both objects would be invisible to you or me, and also to the Cambridge researchers who only had optical telescopes available at the time. They could measure the flux density, like we talked about earlier, and this told them that the radio sources were extremely compact. They then used the moon as a great instrument to use when observing radio sources. The quasar was covered by our natural satellite several times throughout 1962. The astronomers watched for the reappearance of the radio source from behind the lunar disk and were able to get a very precise location for the source. Our friend Martin Schmidt took measurements with his trusty telescope. By the way, this telescope was the largest optical telescope in the world at this time. He found that Quinton the Quasar was the brightest object ever discovered and published his breakthrough discovery in Nature in 1963. He and two other astronomers used redshift data to show that the object was moving away at one third the speed of light making it the fastest moving object discovered. So that was two records that were broken by the same object. 
So the hunt for the fastest and brightest quasars in the universe began. Today we know of one more large achievement of quasars, their distance to Earth. Some quasars have been known to be located over 12 billion light years away. Besides this, they can be 100 times more luminous than the Milky Way galaxy, or any other galaxy that you may choose. The sky had shown us that it had many invisible truths, and the one discovery in radio astronomy that stood out was the distant, bright, fast-moving starlight object known as quasars. So I've been babbling on quite a bit about quasars, but how exactly were they discovered? And what exactly are they? And what do they exactly do? Well, quasars are active galactic nuclei, so therefore they are at the centres of galaxies and they're very busy. Astronomers theorise that all galaxies have a black hole at its centre, and most probably a supermassive black hole. Well, hopefully, anyway and that most quasars are usually discovered at the centre of the oldest of galaxies, although we do see quasars activate when galaxies are merging. So quasars aren't powered like the sun, they are too bright and too energetic. Instead, they are powered by a supermassive black hole. If we study the anatomy of a black hole, we see that there is a region of material, known as the accretion disk and this forms around a region known as the event horizon. The material of the accretion disk heats up to millions of degrees as it's pulled into the black hole. Supermassive black holes are usually billions of times greater in mass to the sun and can produce accretion disks for billions of miles. There is a direct correlation between the mass of the accretion disk and the power output of the jets of a quasar. These jets are known as relativistic jets, and these are beams of plasma that blast out in opposite directions from the quasar. The spin of the black hole gives the quasars its distinct jets, creating a magnetic field, and blasts excess material and radiation into these streams. These streams are superheated plasma and travel extremely close to the speed of light, the study of quasars only started to accelerate in the 1980s. The leading theory was that a quasar can only exist if there is a supermassive black hole at the centre of its parent galaxy. This black hole would be feasting on stellar material that strays too close. A galaxy that would show this type of characteristic would be said to have an active nucleus. An active galaxy can only be detected when the jets of the quasar are angled toward Earth. This sprinkles our planet with radio emissions, and this is how quasars are principally detected by astronomers. If the jets are perpendicular to the Earth's line of sight, then they may never be detected. Instead, we observe what's known as a radio galaxy, a galaxy that spews out large amounts of radio signals. In some rare aspects, the jets of the quasars may actually be directly aligned with Earth. This gives astronomers an excellent field of view of the active nucleus. This rare object is called a blazar, not a blazer. Most quasars in our universe are ancient phenomena, and we only observe them when the universe was relatively young. There are plenty of active galaxies in the universe. Astronomers have speculated that active nuclei are mostly generated by young galaxies. This means that young galaxies tend to have more material falling into the central black hole, and older galaxies, or non-active galaxies, tend to have less material around the central black hole. Therefore, older galaxies point towards a quieter place, for example, the Milky Way galaxy today. Although most galaxies are not far from collisions, Galactic mergings and collisions are very common, and they move material around the galaxy, giving the black hole ample opportunity to feed, and therefore could be activated again, creating a quasar. Speaking of collisions, the Milky Way seems to be on a pathway to one. In 4 billion years, the Milky Way will collide with the Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest large neighbour. When this galactic merge happens, there is a distinct possibility that the two supermassive black holes will feast again, 
creating an elegant and monstrous quasar, or maybe even two. When debating what happens to these objects, astronomers have come up with some rather interesting theories. One problem with quasars is their enormous redshifts. Scientists suggest that this is simply the expansion of space, but some have argued that this may be light that is crawling out of a very large gravitational well. This so-called well would be created by a truly stupendous star, with a gravitational field close to that of a black hole. Yet when we calculate this, it seems like the stupendous star in question would never be stable. Another dare I say far-fetched idea was that a quasar is an opening of a white hole. So basically, a white hole is the opposite of a black hole. Makes sense, right? The idea of this exotic object was hypothesized in 1964. As a theory today, white holes are generally not taken too seriously, unless it's in science fiction. But let's not forget that black holes in the 60s and 70s were an invisible phenomena, and only modern techniques and technology have allowed us to peer behind the cosmic curtain. The idea of a white hole was started by a complex interpretation of Einstein's field equations of general relativity, which uses the notion of black holes that exist in the future must be linked to white holes in the past. The white hole is a region of space where matter and radiation can only leave the object, but can't enter unless they know the password. And these streams of radiation that we observe firing out of quasars would be lined up with a white hole at its centre. But in physics, there's that age-old question of where does all the energy come from? Well, it's quite simple. Well, the answer is quite simple. It came through a wormhole, a theoretical feature of space-time that connects the future to the past. Kind of makes sense. Some theories do suggest that the material entering a black hole may merge into another universe. With the decades and decades passing in astronomy, and our understanding of black holes grew, our theories of white holes have somehow shrunk. But with the study of the theoretical problem of a white hole, this has allowed us to study such events as galaxy collisions and supermassive black hole evolution. So essentially in physics, if something isn't correct, we can still learn from its principles to infer laws that may actually exist within nature. So I hope that's given you a great insight into these quirky quasars, and I hope you've learned other bits and bobs as well along the video. And as always, if you've enjoyed the video, you can click the like button, and if you'd like to support the channel, you can click subscribe. Thank you for watching, and have a lovely day.